Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. John White, Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, and you're watching Coronavirus in Context. Today we're joined by the Acting Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, Dr. Janet Woodcock. Dr. Woodcock, thanks for taking time this afternoon. Great to be here. Let's start off with the issue that everyone is talking about, vaccination for kids ages 5 to 11. So I want to just put it out there, what people are talking about, and give you a chance to respond. So some of the criticism is there weren't enough kids in the trial, roughly 2,200, even though it was a, you know, not a one-to-one -one ratio, that's still not a lot of kids to make this type of decision. Well, you know, this vaccine has gone into over 100 million people, including adolescents down to the age of 12. So with the younger kids, we're looking for what is the right dose because they're smaller. And also, um, you know, do they have any different side effects? No matter how large a trial we had, uh, a very rare, rare side effect might not go uh, um, detected in, in a trial. But a trial, that, the kind of trial that was done would let us know if there was anything unusual or different about this vaccine in the younger kids than in the teenagers or the very large number of adults that have um, received this vaccine. What about the criticism that people say, we really don't know the risk of myocarditis. That's often what people are talking about. If it's one in 50,000, we're not gonna see it in this trial. The panel discussed this and found that the benefits far exceed any risks. What's your response to parents who say, well, we're really not sure what the side effects are. We should wait a while. I understand that the hesitancy. I'm a parent, but this vaccine has really gone into a large number of people if you look at everyone. And um, although children don't uh, get severe COVID as often, we've had many, many cases, thousands of cases of multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome with kids have to actually be hospitalized and often get into the ICU. Also, kids can get long COVID mm -hmm. and there have been deaths in this age group. And of course, any death of a child is a terrible tragedy. What do you say to parents who say, well, it's only two months and we need a longer time period? I thought it'd be interesting for you to compare it to other trials that we do on vaccinations. Isn't two months in general the time frame that we look at for any other vaccine? Well, you know, any of these trials may have extensions where you do a longer term follow up because you're looking both at does the immunity wane over time and do you see anything late? But uh, with vaccines, we know that most of the side effects you're going to see are in the first few weeks after vaccination. Um, particularly the kind of side effects that are immune related and so forth, because that's when the immune uh, response actually happens. So I think we have followed um, both the government and, um, and other countries' governments and the companies have followed uh, recipients of this vaccine for quite a long time. And we pretty much know what, what you know, we don't see anything unusual later on. I've gotten asked this question, so I'm gonna give it to you. What do you do if your child is 11 and a half? <laughs> do you give them <laughs> the third dose or do you give them the full dose? Sure. Well, we've talked about this, you know, internally. And I think either one, if you ever looked at a class of 11 year olds, they're all different sizes. Some of them are yeah. taller than me, right? And some of them are still look like really little kids. So I think um, talk to a pediatrician or the healthcare provider and you can decide what's appropriate for that child. Let's talk about boosters. That's the other thing everyone is talking about. Who should get a booster and when? So I want to pose that to you, Dr. Woodcock. Who should get a booster? And when, and does it matter which one you get? Well, you know, what we have uh, put out there and CDC has agreed with is you can get whatever a vaccine uh, that is authorized or approved in the United States as a booster. You don't have to take the one that you got originally for the first two or one or two injections. Mm -hmm. People who got the J&J, &J, they got a single injection, they should go ahead if they're two, more than two months out and get a booster. 
um, people who have had the other two mRNA vaccines should go ahead and get a booster after, you know, a longer period of time. As far as who, you know, everyone over 65 and then people with comorbidities or people who are working in occupations where they are exposed uh, frequently are all recommended to get a booster. What about for the general population? Um, there's been talk and, and Pfizer has announced that they're going to seek authorization for everyone to be able to receive a booster independent of age for the mRNA vaccine. For them, other people have been talking about it's going to be age 40 and above, irrespective of other health conditions. What can you help tell us in terms of where we are in boosters for a broader population? Sure. Well, you know, right now, the um, recommendations really would apply to a very large amount of the U.S. population because many of the adult population have certain comorbidities. However, it doesn't apply to everyone. And what you're thinking about here and what the health authorities are thinking about is, okay, is uh, in those younger age groups, is immunity waning significantly versus uh, um, what is their risk of experiencing, say, microditis or a side effect, particularly in younger age groups? And so you're balancing those two things um, and making sure that everybody has a positive uh, benefit uh, from getting a, a booster shot. So uh, we'll look at the data um, when it's submitted, and we're watching waning immunity in the United States. And um, you know, that will help us determine whether or not you know, everyone should get a, a booster at some point. Do you expect that decision to be made before the end of the year? You know, it depends on what data we see, how the data come out. Um, uh, it's quite uh, possible that, we, that the um, age could be extended lower uh, if you see that, that younger people are getting breakthrough infections that are, you know, making them sick. But the advisory panel, even on the last recommendation around boosters for the mRNA vaccine was by no way unanimous about broadening in it too much. Uh, a lot of debate back and forth. Would you expect that uh, to again be the issue as we're talking about a broader population that doesn't have underlying health conditions? It really allows us to discuss what are our measurements for waning immunity? What does that mean about breakthrough infections? What's the role of vaccination in general? Um, we can't be boosting ourselves every six months, can we? Right. Well, we have uh, some natural experiments where other countries are boosting their entire population, and we're going to be getting data from there, both on the side effects and what that did uh, to the pandemic in those countries. We're also going to get more... This, you know, it's a dynamic situation and we're watching um, the people who are vaccinated in the United States who are younger and seeing like, are they becoming more vulnerable uh, to uh, more severe COVID breakthrough infections? And if so, obviously, then they should probably get another vaccination. Now to your other point about well, we have to get boosted all the time, we don't know yet. It may be that you get an, enough of the, you know, you get a boost like this and you've had enough to have really durable immunity, or it may not be. Or we may get a variant that um, uh, escapes some of the response to this uh, vaccine. And then people might, like influenza, have to get a slightly different uh, vaccination. It has been an <laughs> argument that the boosters should be reformulated and not simply be the same one that someone got at the beginning of the year. Is, is there some validity to that? Well, the, uh, these immunogens in the vaccines seem to be slightly less, less potent against the Delta variant than they were against the original variant where they were constructed. But it's not that much of a difference. Uh, most people, most scientists who are looking at this believe that the um, breakthrough infections we're seeing are, are from waning immunity, not from the fact that we have a slightly different variant. Let's turn to treatment, therapeutics. And there's been some encouraging uh, data from both Merck and Pfizer about the use of various uh, 
antivirals. Some are old drugs that are being repackaged that were used for HIV. Some are new. Where are we in terms of the FDA review of some of these potentially new therapies to treat COVID? All right, well, um, the first one, uh, molnipiravir, uh, the FDA is gonna have an advisory committee at the end of this month to discuss that agent. That is a polymerase inhibitor. Uh, yeah, it was repurposed from um, its original development, I think for influenza. Um, the other drug that's been in the news lately is simply that Pfizer announced that their protease inhibitor had a significant impact on hospitalizations. Uh, when it was given uh, to outpatients early in infection. So of course, everyone has hoped that we could have a small uh, molecule antiviral that would be oral, that could be used in outpatients. That would be a tremendous advance because as you said, people are, uh, there are gonna be breakthroughs even if people are vaccinated. Some people don't respond to, to vaccination and so forth. So we need a variety of tools in the toolbox. And then finally, Dr. Woodcock, you and I have been talking through a series of interviews over the past 18 months. How much longer are we going to be talking about COVID? How do we decide when the pandemic is over? No one's suggesting that we're saying that it's over right now, but what metrics do we use to decide that it's over? Yes. Well, I mean, there are multiple scenarios. One is the pandemic becomes endemic. Uh, that enough people are uh, have been exposed or resistant that it just is circulating around at lower levels and is not completely, um, you know, um, interfering with the, the process of society. Another scenario of concern is the fact that many areas of the world people are not back vaccinated, uh, have very low vaccination rate, and the fear is that we may see variants arise that are resistant or more virulent or more transmissible or both. Another scenario might be we find a more transmissible uh, variant that is very transmissible and not very virulent. That would be terrific, <laughs> right? Then we just have another respiratory <laughs> infection that people would have to deal with that wouldn't be so, um, so devastating. So I, I, I don't think we know how this is going to, how we're going to come out of this. Uh, and there are various paths that could be followed. And what we need to do, uh, at least what FDA needs to do is make sure we develop and help develop all the tools that can be brought to bear. Well, the FDA processes have never been so public as they have over these past 18 months. What impact do you think that has had in, in terms of the FDA in its interaction with the public in, in terms of people are, are kind of seeing how decisions are made. Is that helping? Is it hurting? Is it promoting political discussion? How would you say it, the impact has been? I've always been a big fan of transparency and I think it's very helpful. However, I think there's an overlay here, both of political opinions and misinformation that is very difficult for everyone to deal with. And so the transparency of the FDA is alongside of other information channels that are putting out a lot of misinformation. And believe me, I hear it. I hear a lot of it because <laughs> transparency works both ways. I hear from the public a lot. And there is a tremendous amount of misinformation out there that's being very diligently disseminated. And so in that regard, although we're trying to be extremely open, uh, we aren't always believed and same yeah. with many other public health institutions and experts. Is it getting worse? I, I believe so. Um, that's hard for me to say, John, you have your finger on the pulse of the media probably better mm -hmm. than I do, <laughs> but it certainly isn't very good um, that, um, you know, we, two years ago say the hope was, okay, we'll get vaccines, we'll get this all under control and so forth. And yet instead we find ourselves in a state where a large number of people, um, adults uh, do not wish to get vaccinated because of what they've heard. And we, so we continue to have this epidemic flourishing. We have people in hospitals, we have a lot of deaths every day and that's not a good situation. 
What keeps you up at night? Well, I mean, I think the worst case scenario is the biggest concern that we'll get a resistant variant that'll that'll still be virulent and uh, arising in some population that is not uh, vaccinated, and it can then then the pandemic can start another wave across the world. But we're more prepared now than we were before. I think everyone has learned a lot. We're prepared, but we're also very tired. Right? And I think the healthcare uh, workers, uh, public health um, apparatus, you know, and the supply chains um, are all very strained right now. And, and so, although we may have a better understanding of how to deal with this, um, we've exhausted a lot of human and um, other resources uh, as we've gone through the last 18 months. But Dr. Woodcock, I wanna thank you again for taking the time to help explain the science behind the decisions that you all are making and, and to inspire confidence in, in terms of the regulatory process. Thanks very much. Great talking to you.